Prof, welcome. It's good to have you with us on 702 Drive. Thank you, John, for so, the invitation. Yeah. So, so let's take ourselves to a part of the country in Limpopo known as Sekakuni Land. You grew up in a small place, Skwenwurt, yeah. um, and the oldest of, of nine children. We'll talk about that and the responsibilities and what's tricky uh, about being the firstborn. But what was the best thing about growing up in Skwenwurt? I think the it was really the fresh air, mm-hmm. the mountains, the rivers, and really there was no pressure except, I think, to enjoy living in a traditional village where everybody was almost your relative, uh, cared about you, loved you almost abundantly and unconditionally. So you never were short of love, respect, and being taught, I think, you know, the traditions of how you grow up being the eldest st- son in a baby sort of tradition. So for people who want to, who may not know Squinwood, specifically larger places, Jane First, uh, Steelport, almost equidistant yeah. between the two. Did you did you go into places like Polokwane, Petersburg as it was then, or was much of your early life spent in the rural environment you've just described? Well, the first 14 years of my life, I grew up in Skunot mm-hmm. because that's where my parents lived. And after f- after 14 years, after I'd done what they used to call Standard 6, yes. my parents sent me to a boarding school at Whitty High School, which was the high school for the University of the North at the time. Okay. It was their training a sort of institution where teachers did their practical trainings at Whitty High School. And that's where I, I, I did my secondary and high school. Yeah. So up in Mang Kueng near the university? It's just a, yeah, it's just a stone's throw from, from the university. In fact, uh, we used to intermingle with uh, university students. And sometimes we used to, when we wanted to impress the girls in the village, As one we, does. we used to tell them, that we are doing a BSc 1 <laughs> or a Chemistry 3 and these girls would just be wowed by it and be surprised as to what we were doing at, uh, at, at high school at the time. But, but eventually you made your way into studying exactly those things. When did you realize that medicine and maybe I should broaden it and say science was, was what you wanted to do? Well... The story goes that when I was born, my grandfather came to see me when I was three days old. Okay. And uh, came to see me and observed me. I don't know for how long. When he came out, he said to my father, I think my grandson will become a great doctor. Hmm. And uh, and from there on, I think in the village, uh, through my primary school, everybody encouraged me or just said, I think you should do medicine. So I had very little choice. But I think as I grew up, I realized that I was more keen on science yes. than on medicine. Right. But, you know, the pressure had grown so much that I think if I had gone into science early on, I would have had a little bit of a strike in my village. So I yeah. decided to honor, I think, uh, the pressure. And then later on, when I finished my medicine, I went to do a science degree at Oxford. Let's talk a little bit uh, uh, about family life. Um, your your uh, father, Muriti, was, was a primary school teacher and a school principal. Your, your mom uh, looked after the house, Mahwadi, uh, but obviously played a big part in your life. How difficult was it? having a, a, a father who was a teacher and a principal, did he run a tight ship in the, in the home as regards your academic work and your performance? Yes, my father did run a tight ship. And even when I grew up, he said to me, the only way you bring up your children, mm. you must remember how I brought you up. Okay. So uh, what he used to do was uh, whenever he was preparing uh, his notes for teaching the following day, he would uh, assemble me and my sister and my other brother and make us... Three eldest? Yeah, the ones that we were, the the eldest three. Okay. And then he would ask us to wash our hands and then we sit with him on the table when he's working on his uh, skin book and we would be reading Mm -hmm. uh, whatever we were supposed, whatever we had to read. And uh, what my father never wanted was that when we read a book, we must make marks on it because he says, 
you are creating a, a struggle for another person yes. that must pay attention to what you have marked rather than leave a book clean. So throughout my career, I don't put marks on any book I read, even if I want to. I just have that sort of aversion. But that's how we we would spend maybe about half an hour with him. Mm -hmm. And occasionally he would say, no, I don't want you to read today. What did you do today at school? Mm -hmm. At 8 o'clock? At 10 o'clock? Or, or he would say, do you remember that poem that you learned maybe a month mm -hmm. ago? Mm -hmm. Can you just recite it for me? So we were always alert to that kind of uh, of training. And I think out of that, uh, he made us almost try to remember everything that we learned at school. We knew that when you went to school, there was a responsibility to remember what you have learned because dad would ask you in the evening. And sometimes when we were tired of that, yes. we would just pretend to be falling asleep. And uh, when you... How, we, did that, how did that work out? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what would happen is that maybe he would come home at around 8 o'clock or so. Yes, yes. And we would pretend we were asleep and we were really snoring and, uh, you know, just like kids would do. And he would, some days he would just leave us. On other days he would wake us up uh, to do some schoolwork. Let, let's talk about food because you talk about... Uh, describing the day and 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 sharing with others in the family was that was that the way meal times worked? Did you gather as a as a family around the table to eat every day, or was that only on some days? No, no. I think we did it every day. My mother was quite uh, uh, consistent on that one. Right. I think she would prepare the meal and then she would bring us to the table. At the time, we lived with her grandmother, our great grandmother. And we would sit there, we would have, a, would say a prayer, and then after that we would all eat, and we will then get stories either from my dad or from mm. my great grandmother, or you know folk folk folklore stories uh, about what happens in in the past and so forth. So we always had lessons of history because I think both my mother yes. and my father, I think they loved history. So we we got to know. I think the traditions, the values, and so forth from 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 the meal tables. Yeah. So your favorite dish that you you shared with us, not the dish, unfortunately, just the name, Murojo Walle Roto, yeah. uh, either ox or sheep liver, uh, pup, and and Murojo yeah. Murojo with it. Where did you find that in Oxford, or did you live without it no, in no. those cold English winters, pining for petty food? No, no, I. I, I pined for it. Yeah. The, it was not there. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the reason why this became obviously a favorite of mine mm. was that it was not just about the food itself. Uh, whenever my mother was preparing this morojo, mm, mm. uh, I think the English name for it is called uh, spider African spider flower. Okay. I think that's the name of it. But greens, huh? Eh? Yeah, it's greens, yeah. When Whenever she was preparing this, she would... Uh, carefully, you know, uh, take the softer parts of the, of this uh, uh, flower. And uh, during that time, she would share with you, I think, her concern. You would understand the things. Okay. That in, so it was more about uh, the, the whole issue rather than just about preparing the food. So it was bonding over the preparation Correct. of food. Correct. Yeah. And sometimes you would understand some of her dilemmas mm. about, you know, having to buy us books, having to buy us clothes, and uh, what were the issues in the family. And uh, being the eldest, I was often subjected to that. When mm. she did mm. this, preparing this morojo, she would want to sit with me. And, uh, and then I would sort of get what this family is about more than my other siblings. Yeah, uh, the the... Both the pleasures and the pressures yeah. of, of, of being firstborn. Yeah. I, I'm going to jump a long way into, okay. into your book, yeah. uh, Management Teams, Why They Succeed or Fail. It's the work of somebody who will actually be 97 next month, Meredith Belbin, uh, a very esteemed person in management science. Um, and I understand that, uh, because I haven't read the book, but it, it looks at the importance of diversity and personality types when you wish to put an initiative of any kind yeah. together. If I've got it broadly right, yeah. why is that book so special for you, Prof? Uh, it's, it's very special for me because uh, for 29 years I've been in leadership uh, positions right. and I've been trying to find the best way to create successful teams. And this was uh, one of the earliest books I came to read. 
But why it has become so important now, I had to revisit it, is because we are in a leadership mess in South Africa. Yeah. And I'm in the process of writing a book about leadership. Okay. And I thought I would visit it. And one of the essence of the book, as you say, it's about diversity. It's about, uh, it's about synergies, not so much about intellect, mm. but about the synergy of how you create a team that becomes successful. And it often depends on behavioral patterns and tendency of people, uh, uh, how they behave themselves. For example, I think uh, all of us recognize that when Nelson Mandela came into power uh, after 1994, the one thing that we remember him for was he wanted the country to be together to reconcile. Now, a person who does that yes. can only do it if he is able to coordinate people and bring them together. So that kind of a, a behavioral tendency mm. is called a coordinator in leadership. Okay, well, so we... Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we anticipate with, with great interest the book uh, as you as you write it. Well, maybe I don't know if you listen to music yes. uh, while you while you thinking or writing or whatever. But in a long full life, there's so much music you could have chosen. But you 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 chose Stevie Wonder. It's a yeah. 1976 album, his 18th. It won him a Grammy. Songs in the key of life. Uh, Stevie Wonder special in your life, and if so, why? Well, first of all, let's remember that he was actually part of the struggle. Mm. I think, uh, you know, the anti-apartheid movement in the U.S., the civil rights and so forth. So he has been involved in that. But in, in terms of music, I think he has always related back to Africa uh, in some of his compositions and some of his songs. But uh, the particular song that I chose really comes from that album that came out in 1976 called Songs in the Key of Life, right. which is regarded as his best work in music. And it has influenced so many other musicians in life. And during my time, mm -hmm. it was almost like the signature song of our functions or our parties, right. whether wild or, or sophisticated. And even up to these days, my generation, when that song plays you can still feel that they feel the beat of that song. So, I mean, my, my wife, who loves the song dearly, yes. so whenever it plays, I think you can see the twinkle in her eye and, uh, you know, she can try and move here and there, but, uh, but nevertheless, you can see that it reminds her.